Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In this episode, we're going to look at a really unusual diode pump solid state laser. Uh, it's unusual because it emits light at 561 nanometers, which is right between the yellow and green on the spectrum. Uh, this is actually marketed as a yellow laser, um, but to some people it looks green, so this will cause some arguments in the comments, no doubt. So let's fire this on the bench and take a look. So this is the 85YCA050 DPSS laser. I picked this up on eBay for a fairly reasonable price, mostly because it didn't come with a controller. Uh, and as you can see at the back there, um, there's many, many connections to try and figure out what they all do. Um, the reason I picked this up though is because it has a very unusual wavelength of 561 nanometers, um, which is frequency doubled from 1122, uh, which is one of the uh, available YAG lines. Um, it's a very, very unusual color, somewhere between green and yellow. It's like a, a yellow that wants to be green or a green that wants to be yellow. Um, some people see it as yellow, some people see it as green. So it's, it's a really, really peculiar wavelength. We'll just pop the lid on this and take a look inside. Um, this is really, really um, incredibly well built. It's some piece of engineering for sure. Um, so I'll just go through things from left to right. Um, first of all, uh, this cable is mine. Um, I added it in order to power this thing up and the components on the left uh, I also added and we'll talk about those afterwards. Uh, but we've got the C-mount uh, laser diode here itself. Um, I estimate the power of this to be somewhere between um, 2 and 3 watts perhaps in order to in order to drive this whole assembly to threshold. Uh, this is based on like the threshold current of the laser diode itself which is uh, sort of remarkably high. In front of this we've got two beam shaping uh, and focusing optics which focus the beam onto the back of the vanadate crystal which is on this mount here. And if we rotate it a little bit, you should be able to see uh, the vanadate down there. Uh, in front of the vanadate is a, a Brewster plate. Um, and this is, you know, to provide some level of polarization uh, for the output beam. Uh, so, you know, the, like this is, the, this is the main cavity as it were. So if we put a Brewster angle plate inside the cavity, we'll end up with polarized light coming out as well. After this is the frequency doubling crystal. Uh, this could be uh, KTP. Uh, which is potassium titanyl phosphate, or it could be LBO, which is lithium triborate. If it's LBO, um, LBO is hygroscopic, so it'll draw moisture from the air, and that might explain the presence of these pillow pack desiccants uh, in the front of the assembly there. Uh, we've got the output coupler here, uh, and then finally we've got uh, a little pick-off to pick off uh, a portion of the beam, uh, so that the controller, if we had it, will be able to tell what the output power was and presumably stabilize uh, the output. After that we've got collimation lens, uh, and then of course the beam exits through the front. Uh, underneath these two uh, metal slabs are thermoelectric coolers. Um, these need to, you know, both of these sections need to be maintained uh, independently at the correct temperature. So the wavelength of um, uh, semiconductor laser diodes will drift uh, with temperature. So if you heat them up, the wavelength will get longer, and if you cool them down, it'll get shorter. Um, and likewise, this assembly here um, requires to be at the correct temperature for maximum output. If we move back to the left here, um, this laser, when I first opened it up and tested it, um, it actually read dead short across the laser diode, and that's because there's a relay in the back of the head here, which can't get to very easily, uh, which actually shorts out the laser diode when it's not in use. Um, so what I've actually done here is soldered um, a 100 ohm resistor across the laser diode to help try and prevent um, ESD damage to it. And I've also got a, a small 1N4148 um, diode soldered across as well to catch any negative going transients. Laser diodes are very, very sensitive devices and it seems that the higher power the laser diode is actually the more sensitive they are to things like static discharge. Uh, so it is an important step. The old wires that go into the back of the head here, I've just put a bit of uh, heat shrink tubing over the ends uh, just to insulate those and just tucked them in behind the uh, laser diode block. Um, I've soldered on a, a cable here, uh, whoops, let me get hold of the thing, um, which comes outside the head, so this is just for the laser diode itself. I've got a one ohm resistor in series with a negative lead. This is so I can measure current um, when I'm powering up the laser diode, so I can just measure millivolts across it. So if it's a thousand millivolts, it's a thousand milliamps. Um, just as, just for, as a precaution, because I suspect that this might be uh, LBO and it will be destroyed by uh, water in the atmosphere. The hole that I've drilled through the case there, uh, I've actually epoxied up as well. 
It is important not to run uh, bare, you know, unknown diodes like this off of benchtop supplies. Benchtop supplies are notoriously noisy uh, generally unless you have like a really high-end well-conditioned power supply. Um, you know when you turn them on you can get um, spikes in current uh, which could well destroy the laser diode. So I'm actually going to use um, a small laser diode driver that's been designed for the purpose um, to try and drive this today. Currently I have the laser diode powered up here and it's drawing about 413 milliamps. If I put a piece of paper in the beam path uh, we might be able to see on camera there uh, the infrared light being emitted from the 808 nanometer diode. Um, I think we're just about at threshold here which is you know like I say it's remarkably high uh, threshold current. So I'll turn it up a little bit more. Uh, we'll get up to about um, 550 milliamps or so. So we're about there now, about 560 odd milliamps uh, and we should be well above threshold for the um, 808 nanometer diode. So we should be able to very clearly see on camera there the spot on the paper. So the camera can pick up the infrared but obviously your eye can't. If we jack up the current some more, uh, I think when we get to about 590 milliamps or so it will be enough to threshold um, the vanadate and we should be able to see a, a yellowish spot um, as our output. So we're just about at threshold there. So I'm going to keep going to about 770 odd milliamps. So we're at 767 milliamps just now and we've got a really really brilliant uh, yellow spot. As I've said this is capable of uh, you know producing about 50 milliwatts but that would depend on the temperature being correct for all of the um, for all of the sub assemblies there. So this is about as far as I'm going to push it today. But yeah brilliant uh, yellow or is it green spot? Uh, if we take a look at the cavity since we've got the cavity open to the camera here uh, you should quite clearly be able to see uh, the infrared light from the YAG. Um, it should show up as bluish or whitish uh, on the camera I imagine so that would be all the infrared leaking out um, but yes a very very uh, nice DPSS laser it has to be said and the color is really really striking as well obviously if this is LBO I'm going to want to put the lid back on um, but probably best warming this thing up and warming these gel packs up before I do that just to drive out uh, any moisture that might be in the air so I'm going to put the lid back on and then we'll take a look at the beam in some smoke So I've set up two lasers side by side. On the left here we've got a 532 nanometer green laser pointer and then on the right we've got our 561 nanometer yellow laser. Uh, to me the one on the right looks a brilliant yellow and the one on the left looks a brilliant green. Uh, but I showed this to someone else and they said well this looks green. Um, and when I pressed them a little bit they said well it looks like a, a lime green or perhaps a chartreuse. Um, which would be about right because chartreuse sits exactly between green and yellow um, on the pigment spectrum um, I guess and on the electromagnetic spectrum uh, 561 nanometers is exactly on the border between yellow and green uh, so I suppose both answers are correct but you know you, you guys can fight it out down in the comments below um, is it yellow or is it green Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below and I'll see you guys next time.